1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 24, where we left off. So David hid himself in the field, somewhere in the field. And when the new moon was come, the first day of the month for the Jewish people, a lunar calendar, the king sat him down to eat meat. Now, suggestion would be that it may imply to the feast day because the first day of the moon, the first day of the month, every month, we read last time in Numbers 10.10 10, is a feast, is a celebration. And the king sat upon his seat as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. So what you're going to do is you're going to put a king in the spot that he's going to be watched and he's going to be protected. No one's going to come up behind and, you know, put a knife in his back or anything. So wherever the king is, somebody's got an eye on him. It's protection. And I would assume that the president and the queen and all that would have such a kind of seat that everybody can see. If not, they're surrounded by the president would be the secret service. And Jonathan arose. And Abner sat by Saul's side. That's the captain of the armies. And David's place was empty. He's not there. He's out in the field. It's the first of the month. Now, nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day. Looks over, seat's empty. For he thought something, that's the first time that word shows up, something. When I went through this, like, I, I, I double checked the trip. I mean, you're telling me we've gone all this far and we haven't used the word something yet? Had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he's not clean. Leviticus 7.20. And it would imply what we're going to read now is that this is not just any meal before the king. It looks like the king every first of the month had this seating made with the feast. And 7.20. But the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, that would have been the feast of tabernacles, that pertains unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. So what Saul's thinking, you know what? He's not eating tonight. He's not here because something's befallen him. He, he's in sin. And that's why he's not at the table. Otherwise, it wouldn't be really no much matter. He looks over at David's not here. Oh, well, more for me. And it came to pass on the morrow... The next day, the second day, which is the second day of the month, that David's place was empty again. Saul looks over. Oh, this is two nights in a row. Two days. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son. Now, look, look who he turns to right away. Jonathan. We don't know how many people are at that table, but he looks at Jonathan. Jonathan, wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to me, neither yesterday nor today? See, he knows the relationship between Jonathan and David. And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked, leave of me to go to Bethlehem. Well, this is that plan that David and Jonathan concoct. That we're going to find out if the, you know, is Saul really angry? And in chapter 20, verse 6, here's this plan. And if thy father, talking to Jonathan, had all missed me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. So, in verse 28, it's not a lie. That's exactly what David asked. So David may lie himself, but he's not allowing someone else to lie for him. He worded it so that Jonathan would be telling the truth. Now David lied. And he said, let me go, I pray thee, for our family has a sacrifice in the city that wouldn't have passed to the tabernacles. Or any of the feast day. Listen, my family, it's a special day. And this special day of the special days, my family has a sacrifice. And they want me to be there. So this is no ordinary first day of the month. 
My brother, he has commanded me to be there. That's the lie. And now if I have found favor in thy eyes, let me get away. I pray thee, and see my brother. Lie. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. So he's going to his family's house. That's why he's not here. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of a female dog. Thou son of a bee. You see, that's not what it says. That's what the Living Bible says. And the Living Bible is written for children. Kenneth Tyler wrote that Bible so children would understand it more. And he puts S-O-B. Now, he has been so harassed by Bible-believing Christians that his new Living Bible has now been changed. And it says full. But if you get yourself an old Living Bible that my grandma had who never swore, decent woman, and I opened up to the passage here. I said, Grandma, just start reading here. I, I don't know, 28, 29, I forget where I I just start reading. She's reading out loud. And <laughs> she closed the living Bible and closed it forever and got herself a King James Bible. Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Now that's an insult to Jonathan, to Saul's wife, and Jonathan's mother. And what's the problem? We'll see what the problem is. It's not Jonathan, and it's not his mother. It's not Saul's wife. We'll see in a few moments. Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thy own confusion? That's why he said, uh, Jonathan, where's David? Saul knows the relationship with these two men. And unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. It's a family thing. I am the king. I am your father. Your mother gave birth to, to you. And you have confused yourself with another man. And we'll, let's keep reading on verse 31. Is the key. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground. Thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. There's the motive. Jonathan, don't you realize, you perverted brat, that man David, that man son of Jesse, he's got the kingdom. And if I kill him, it's going to be yours. And then you can take care of your mother. But you have perverted your mother. You had no disregard for your mother. You don't care because you let Jesse go, his son, and that man's going to take over your king. Saul knows exactly what's going on. And we finally read the motive. He's out to kill David because he wants his family to be on that throne. And God says, I'm done with you. That throne belongs to David. And Saul is has and will be trying to change what God said. There's the motive. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. For what? Not being at the dinner table? No. Because he's the next one in line, and let's stop that, Jonathan. You and I together, let's stop that throne so I can give it to you, son. And direct rebellion against what God. So Saul knew. And Jonathan answered Saul his father. And said unto him. Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? 1917. And Saul said to Michael. What hast thou done? Why hast thou deceived me so and sent away my enemy? He is escaped. And Michael answered Saul, said he, he said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? His family is sticking up for David, and Saul is angry. And over here in chapter 20, David puts forth 
Oh, where is it? Well, David, chapter 20, and Jonathan, like, what did I do wrong? What is my sin? What is my wickedness that your father has done this for me? I am one foot stuck in the grave. Verse 3. And in verse 8, listen, if I've done anything guilty, if I'm guilty, if I violated the king in this country, kill me. So here comes Jonathan. All right, Dad, you want me to go get him? I'll go get him, but you better tell me why you want him dead. Now, he is not disrespecting the king, and he's not disrespecting his father. If you name to me what David's sin is, I'll bring him. Because David said, if there be iniquity, slay me thyself. So Jonathan's youth, hey, okay, you tell me what he done wrong, you tell me his sin, and I'll bring him here. That's what David said. What has he done? And look at Saul's answer. And Saul cast the javelin at him to smite him. What an answer. The answer he gives to Jonathan, bling. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. He's so angry he was just going to kill the next in line for the throne if he were to kill David. This Saul has lost his mind and lost his heart. He has deep rage on David as Satan has a deep rage against the children of Israel. So Jonathan arose from this table in fierce anger. <laughs> Everybody at this table is angry. And did eat no meat on the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David, because his father had done him shame. Jonathan's upset. He, he's been ashamed. He knows his father's wrong. He knows David is right. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David. They both set a time. We're going to be at this spot. And a little lad with him. A little child. And he said unto the lad, Jonathan, run. Find out now the arrows which I shoot. So Jonathan has brought his artillery, his, his bow and arrows. And this little child. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow. That's the first time arrow shows up. Beyond him. Now, Jonathan and David had come up with this little plan. If you shoot the arrows beyond the child, it ain't safe, David. Go. Go in peace. Leave. But if you shoot those arrows be right by that child and say, hey, look to the right and pick them up, come on. Nothing's wrong. Now, that shows you the expertise that Jonathan is with a bow and arrow, that he can do this. And set forth David who's listening. Look beyond you. There's the weapons. There's the arrows. Go get them. Uh, it's not safe. Or he aims those arrows right near that child without hitting that child. Hey, look to the right. They're right by you. David hit. Okay. Everything's well. So Jonathan knows how to aim. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot. Jonathan cried out to the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And that's telling David, It's not safe. And Jonathan cried out to the lad, Make speed, hey, stay not. And Jonathan had gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the lad knew not anything. That, that child had no idea what was going on. He thought it was just a typical day, archery practice, and he had to tell me where to go. But David was somewhere around. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. Jonathan's taking no chances. Because entire David's life, people are telling on David to, to saw. And Jonathan gave his artillery. That's the first time that showed up. Now look at that word artillery, military. 
And in verse 28, Lee, as Lee. So any military personnel who wants to go ashore, who wants to go into town, who wants to go home to his family, who wants to take a little vacation, he gets what he calls leave. It's a period of time of something that a soldier wants to do on his own. In the, in the Navy, it's called shore leave. I want to go ashore and buy some trinkets or whatever. These words are taken out of the Bible. King James. So he gave his artillery into the left. That would be the bows and arrows, the arrows, and said unto him, Go, carry them to the city. That little boy's job is done. He had no idea what he was doing. Be warned, God may be having us to do things we have no idea what we did. And as soon as the lad was gone, David rose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. I don't know why. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. That's the first time that word shows up. David cried so much he could not cry anymore. This is a guy who's been in complete anxiety. He has no meal for three days as far as we know. The king wants him dead. He's had to leave his wife. His wife had to lie for him. And he gets to the point, it's not safe to come home no more, David. And he just breaks down and bawls. And Jonathan don't make fun of him. And it happens. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, between my seed, that be Jonathan's son, and thy seed forever. And he, Jonathan, arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. What a mistake! Why did he go with David? If he knew his father's wrong. And that mistake, one of the mistakes, 1 Samuel 31 6. 1 Samuel 31 6. We'll, we'll do verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain at Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua and Saul's sons. If Jonathan would have stayed with David, not going with his father, he wouldn't have been dead. He would have been perfectly safe to stay with David. Say, David, you know what? My father's wrong. You're right. We love each other. We are men in combat. We are comrades in arms. Go in peace. But one more thing. Yeah, we made a pact. You protect my faith. I'm going with you too. He would have been wise to do a roof. Where you go, I go. Your God is my God. Where you die, I'm going to die. But Jonathan will die in the hands of the Philistines with his father who commits suicide. And David's still alive. You realize what would happen if Jonathan survived and was with David and David took that kingdom? I'm trying to think what, what uh, I can't remember who, who uh, Joab. It would not have been Joab, the captain of the army. He would have sent Jonathan. And as Jonathan was really wise with David, Jonathan would be like, David, don't do that. You need to come to war with me. Remember that time when my father chased you? You get your butt out there with me. Don't you dare send me out and you're not going. But Jonathan dies in battle in the Philistine. He should not have gone back to his father. Should have gone with David on the run. David was right. 